I forgot to turn on the recording, so I got to restart. Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Brett Schonzenbach. I'm the president and CEO of the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, and we're very pleased to host this seminar today from our partners at Cal State San Marcos. And they've been great partners throughout the years, but what they've stood up now um, is even above and beyond, um, you know, with in light of COVID and everything that's happening. I'm super excited for them to present to you what they have, uh, what they have to offer. And to get us started, I'm gonna introduce our uh, moderator, our facilitator for today, and that will be Mr. Jim Hammerly. Jim is responsible for the culture, strategic planning, and relationships with the community for the College of Business Administration at Cal State San Marcos. He has over 10 years of teaching experience and specializes in entrepreneurship and intrapreneurship. Jim also serves on boards of community service organizations, new ventures, and business incubators. Before joining Cal State San Marcos, Jim have over, had over 30 years of business experience, 15 as an entrepreneur, and 15 doing corporate research and venturing in large corporations, including senior executive positions. And I was, I was fortunate enough in my uh, previous role um, at the Vista Chamber of Commerce to have Jim on my board of directors um, for several years. And so got to know him then. And so glad when he became the Dean of the College of Business just a couple of years back. And so extremely excited to uh, turn over the program to you today, Jim. Great, thank you very much, Brett. And thanks to you and to the Chamber for hosting us today. Absolutely. So there are two important things we do in COVID that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. One, obviously, is to educate and prepare our students to enter the business world. But a second element that's very important to us and part of our strategy is to assist our local business communities. So you'll see, I'm gonna share my screen here for a moment. Um, and you'll see that uh, a recent informal survey that we did of our business partners illustrates the areas that were affected by COVID-19. Uh, you may have also seen the San Diego Chambers survey released earlier this morning that 41% of all businesses saw revenue declines in excess of 80%, 93% saw staffing declines, and roughly 50% of reported workspace changes will continue after the state of emergency is over. So what we did is we took these, uh, this feedback that we received from our business partners and also other sources and broke down into four pillars or areas where we think the College of Business can help. So what we're here today to do is to offer several hours of pro bono consulting, no charge, to business owners, which our team, after you've met with them, will then review and return with a one-page series of recommendations as well as possible resources to help you. So um, there will be no doubt questions along the way. So if you'd use the chat session to record any questions that you have, and we've reserved about 20 minutes at the end to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I'll also repeat this offering statement at the end so it's clear what we're offering and what the engagement on your part will be required. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nula. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Nula Campany. Um, I am, as it says here, former director of organization development at Qualcomm. But um, the last couple of years, I've been part of the um, faculty at the College of Business, as well as an executive residence. Um, so that's been a very exciting change for me. Um, I have probably about 25 years of experience in organization and talent development with both very large organizations as well as small organizations and nonprofits. Um, so a little bit about my background. I'm also um, the, the people person, um, charge of the people and organization pillar for, for this um, consulting effort. And just sort of thinking about, you know, kind of some of the, the things that your organizations may be experiencing in terms of, you know, COVID-19, whether it's trying to get the workforce back on site, dealing with, um, you know, remote work. 
uh, you know, so there are a myriad different ways that the people in our organization are impacted. And we, you know, we're all sort of very aware that um, our workforce is a, you know, essential component in the success of, of the organization. Um, so the people and organization pillar um, focuses on some key kind of workforce related areas that, that may need attention as you transition through whether it's a return to work, a restart or even a refocus of your business. You know, so obviously changes in strategy, products, services, you know, even the customer base or ways of working can all have a very profound impact on, on your people. Um, so, you know, you need a solid plan to retain your best talent and to maintain productivity. So thinking about kind of, you know, employee retention and engagement, I mean, those are really kind of two, two sides of the same coin. You know, are you seeing in your organization um, increased turnover or even just the difficulty to get people to come back to work? Um, you know, it's likely that employee morale and um, optimism suffered as, you know, since the start of COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic back, in, um, back in March. Um, so, you know, you're seeing a drop in um, employee motivation and engagement. Um, you're experiencing, as I said, you know, increased um, uh, productivity. Um, you know, there's some, obviously some immediate actions that we can take. For example, um, how about doing a risk assessment of your of your talent, especially you know to identify who are your key employees um, at all levels of the organization that are essential um, to your company's success. You know, a lot of times. Um, you know, we think we know what motivates employees, but until we actually sit down one-on-one -on -one with folks to find out, you know, what motivates them, what their concerns are, you know, their concerns about safety, um, you know, we don't really know. So that's kind of one of the tools that we would, you know, we would offer as part of our consulting package. Um, you know, a simple pulse survey can also be a great way to get kind of feedback from your employees um, and get a real kind of pulse on, you know, the level of um, engagement, you know, what are the concerns? A lot of times employees don't want to bring things up to us, but if we give them away um, anonymously to, to kind of report, um, that can do a lot to, to kind of give us um, some real data that we can move forward with for the organization. Um, you know, are employees getting to do their best work every day? Um, are they using their skills to their full advantage? Um, are they getting the feedback that they need from their supervisors? Um, do they understand the goals and the direction, especially if there have been changes in that? Um, you know, are they struggling to work remotely? So, you know, being able to gather that information, um, you know, if we, once we have that feedback, then we can take appropriate action to leverage areas of strength, um, as well as, you know, address any gaps. Um, you know, your supervisors might need some simple tools and training to improve um, their ability to give feedback and coach. Um, maybe you need a communication plan um, for your leaders to ensure that everybody is clear on the, the goals and the direction. And it's very common that strength changes in strategy, our markets, our customer base, or ways of working, you know, they're driving a need for upskilling or cross-training um, your current workforce. You know, we're hearing a lot of organizations have had to downsize their workforce. I was actually talking to an organization the other day that has actually um, had to hire 90 new employees. So a huge need for training, um, you know, and how do you do that in an effective and efficient manner? You know, when we think of training, Training, we tend to think of, you know, um, classroom training, but there are a lot of other ways that we can approach this. Maybe all we need is a checklist or job shadowing or on the job training. So creating a training plan is a great way to spell that out to make sure that we're getting the training to, you know, the right training to the right people in the right time. Um, you know, we also have to think about um, how does, how do changes, you know, the changes that we're experiencing, um, are they driving a need to, to make some adjustments to how we're currently structured? Um, what we see, you know, is that 
we may see that there are now bottlenecks or other opportunities to increase efficiency. Um, you know, if we have changed, you know, have we seen changes to process that have resulted in a lack of clarity about who's responsible for what? Um, is there confusion around decision making, you know, leading to um, increased lead times? So mapping out, for example, a new or changed process or facilitating even just a structured discussion around roles and accountabilities or decision rights can be very helpful in these situations getting you know everybody kind of on board with where they need to be and then finally you know we, we a lot of attention is paid to corporate culture um, we all have a vague sense of what that is and what it looks like in our organizations and it can be really hard to define but it's really kind of um, I think one of the best definitions I've seen is it's kind of the set of enduring and underlying assumptions and norms that determine how things get done in the organization. So in other words, it's the levers that are being pushed or pulled to accomplish the goals of the organization. And it obviously has a profound effect on every level in the organization, um, from senior leaders all the way down to your frontline employees. So doing a simple audit of your culture could help you determine if your current culture supports the future direction of your organization and from there again you have the data in which to put together a plan to you know to make those changes those adjustments so that you do have the culture that's going to support you know your desired future I'm going to stop there and I'm going to pass it on to the next pillar I think Jim you are asking to have questions at the end is that right correct yes please thank you thank you Nola Miguel Thank you, Jim. So I am the director of uh, business development for the College of Business Administration. Uh, I've got roughly 35 years of experience leading business management, global sales and marketing with two Fortune 500 companies and have managed directly a $200 million sales organization with about 1200 sales reps, 125 uh, indirect managers and then seven senior managers to get to those levels of new business growth and development. And I currently provide uh, leadership and sales training to professionals, as well as transformational leadership coaching to, to the marketplace in general. I also am in a faculty, so I get a chance to uh, teach those freshly minted, soon to graduate seniors from the College of Business Administration on the real deal on how to perform in the marketplace, uh, do sales, sales development, business development, and most importantly, sales management. So without knowing the scope of many of you on the call, there's probably three areas that I think I would like to focus you on in terms of, of the growth pillar. And the growth pillar is a very important one, but it also starts with the mindset, skill sets, and the tool sets that you as individual leaders and um, uh, leaders in your specific disciplines bring to the table. And uh, while I'm not going to speak a lot about uh, mindset other than probably making a statement that it is probably a good time to always reconsider all options that are on the table, all options that are presented to you, and probably dismiss or at least put in waiting the old notions of we tried that and it didn't work before. Uh, we are uncovering and, and actually uh, unleashing our skill sets and our thinking into new areas of development that we have never been before. Uh, the current marketplace conditions as well as the current um, uh, socioeconomic conditions in the country and the trending uh, levels of engagement by, in, in public demonstrations has had a tremendous impact. And by the way, I think it will continue to have an impact going into probably 1Q or 2Q of 2021. Now, the reason I say that is because until there is a vaccine, I think there's going to be hesitation and trepidation on the part of many people to do things way outside the bounds of what they feel comfortable with. In fact, the current conditions after the reopening of California has indicated that there are a number of counties that have gone back into a, um, a protection mode. Uh, San Diego County as of this morning still remains open, uh, but uh, if corona cases uh, and reportings hit, hit the thresholds that, uh, that hopefully they won't, then San Diego will likely be closed down also for an indeterminate amount of time, which raises the question. So depending on the business that you're in, how do you grow your business? 
I'm sure that some of you have given that thought, if not all of you. Uh, there are various ways to do that, but it requires strategic thinking, analysis, and engagement with the notion of being open to new ideas and fresh ideas. Here's an idea. If your business model currently does not have an active, fully engaged with uh, plenty of advertising spend in the area of digital marketing, then you are probably not doing the best thing for yourself. If you believe that the economy will, will be slow to return and recover until the introduction of a vaccine, then you're clearly understanding that that will probably be the second quarter of 2021. If that's true and you do not have an e-commerce business today, you should actively engage one, actively enroll in creating one, and then continue to move forward. So when you take a look at where do you get your business today? How are you currently engaging and re-engaging with your existing customers? And more importantly, how are you finding new customers? If you don't have systems that are supporting you today that capture two basic things on behalf of people that visit your store, either physically or online, uh, they're called autoresponders and CRMs, then you're missing a tremendous opportunity to stay engaged and to communicate value to your customers. So let me go to item number two. What products and services make up 80% of your sales? So those of you who are familiar with the Pareto principle, 80% uh, of your sales is probably coming from 20% of your client base. Do you know who they are? How are you engaging with them? How are your employees engaging with them? How are you staying in touch? Do you have a stay in touch program? How would you create one if you needed to have one, if you don't have one? So there is a lot of work and a lot of thinking that we at the university work with our students to make sure that we do the strategic analysis and planning and do the process of whiteboarding pretty efficiently so we can develop a good funnel flow of both information from your clients and to your clients to help them re-engage and to help you re-engage with them. So, what does your marketing and branding generate? How does it generate customer sales? So that would be a question that I would have for you. How do you do that today? Are you focused on social media? How do you track it? Do you have KPIs, key performance indicators that are delivered to you minimally once a week in final form for you to make decisions and decide which pieces of advertising are currently working for you across all platforms. So I tend to be and recommend to my clients to be platform agnostic. Uh, I only look at the data. If Facebook is working this week, then let's do more Facebook. If Instagram is better, let's do Instagram. If LinkedIn is the best source for your clients based on your business model, well, let's do more of that. So there's a lot of opportunities that basically through data analysis will guide you and steer you, steer you to the best possible next step for your business. And if you're not tracking your KPIs and getting a consistent report, then how do you know whether your ad spend or your strategies are even working? Um, so that's an important element that I encourage everyone to start taking a look at in relationship to your current business model. So let let me go to item number four. Do you need to reposition product services and pricing? It depends, and it depends on the nature of your business. So if you're in the retail trade today or hospitality, there are a number of things that you have to do to retool and re-engage not only your clients, but also to make your locations safe to the general public. Uh, until the public itself feels comfortable that all safety precautions are being implemented at the local level, there will be hesitation, there will be pause, there will be delay, and people simply won't participate in your business model. But here's the business model they will participate in. Anything that's online, anything that's e-commerce, all e-commerce stores. I was having a conversation the other day with a, one of the leaders at Lazy Acres. So they have seen uh, through Lazy Acres, which is a, is a, is a wholesale equivalent, um, a Whole Foods equivalent in that space competing with Amazon, They're, they have experienced a 600 that's six zero zero percent increase in produce sales through online ventures, et cetera. So guess what they're gonna be investing more in? 
online sales, online services in all of their five stores in Southern California. So if you're not experiencing that kind of growth, it's because you ought to take a look at your business strategy, the plan that you've got in place, how you're executing it and your uh, KPIs on a regular basis. Um, so that leads me to the last point or question that I would suggest you take a look at in terms of uh, your marketing, selling and servicing online. To what extent do you do that today? Do you know how much of your marketing spend is going to physical versus online? How much direct selling do you have? Do you have distribution channels? Who do you joint venture with? Which clients are in your space that are currently, and other vendors, by the way, that are currently touching the very same, the very same clients that are your ideal buyer? And you have a relationship with them established for referral purposes. So I'm going to recommend um, and suggest to everyone uh, on the call, there are a couple of trends that you should pay attention to going into the next uh, nine months to a year. And that is video is going to continue to be a large, large opportunity for those uh, uh, suppliers, vendors, and, and uh, manufacturers that spend some time and invest in time in video transactions, video sales, etc. And we all have to get better at storytelling. That is a marketing concept. We can all learn it. It's not difficult, but it does require some investment of time, energy, and thought process to expand and extend our knowledge and growth. I'm going to recommend to everybody on the line, if you've got some free time, uh, or you can get it in audio format, there are probably two readings that I would suggest to help you develop and tell better stories. And one is called uh, by Donald Miller. It's called Marketing Made Simple. Uh, excellent book that'll act as a great primer to help you with marketing expertise if you're missing or have some gaps in your development training or expertise. And then the second one, which is an awesome book, um, is, is written by a gentleman by the name of Noah Goldstein. So Noah co-authored that book with another gentleman that I've studied with, Dr. Robert Cialdini, who basically has studied the psychology of getting to yes. And there are six critical factors in your branding, in your communications, in your sales training, in your scripting, that if you do that correctly, clients most often will say yes to you, engage with you, and also provide you recurring opportunities for growth into the future. So that basically covers uh, my pillar of growth. Jim, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Miguel. So next we have Sam Clark. Sam? Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sam Clark. I'm an assistant professor at the College of Business, also the director of the CSUSM Innovation Hub. Um, serial entrepreneur and been around a lot of businesses and, and uh, still involved in a number of them. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about pivoting. And th the reason why we put this in here is that obviously there are really two basic functions that every business has to do. Somebody's got to build a product and somebody's got to sell it. And Within those, when we talk about pivoting, it's really recreating some relationships in those processes, uh, how we make values uh, available to our customers. And so there's a lot of challenges that have appeared recently uh, due to new regulations, uh, changing in customer behavior and, and customer needs, um, technology that's been changing. So pivoting isn't something new, but it's definitely uh, needed quite a bit now uh, more than it has been in the in the recent past um, as we we shuffle through kind of this new world in which we live and have to operate our businesses and so there's a couple of things that we look at when we're, we're talking about pivoting is is really the first thing is is the relationship between the value we create and our customers needs right that's kind of that product market fit and we have to understand whether or not those things have changed over a period of this this period of time and, and in some cases they have um, why they buy your product may be different now than it was before uh, the, the pandemic. And so looking at that and understanding that and how to reposition, how to change what we're doing is important. Also, you know, new mar markets and products and, and processes will, will spin up as, um, you know, these needs arise. There, there are new needs that didn't exist. I, I was talking to a friend of mine, Alex Waters. He runs the Jacobs Center's uh, 
uh, accelerator in San Diego. And he says what he's found is there's a lot more people interested in buying products for their home because people are spending a lot more time in their home than they did in their office. Um, and so, so there's a lot more, uh, uh, these new needs are, are coming up. Um, so, so these are some of the things that think about it. And we look and evaluate the business and, and understand what are these relationships and do we need to create new relationships in, in our processes? Uh, a couple of quick examples that I'd like to share are some of the companies that I've been working with recently and how we looked at some of these changes and how they impact the business. I, I worked with um, eight breweries over the past few months. And, and if you guys are familiar with the brewery marketplace and uh, kind of how that all, all works, what we found, what, what happened is these breweries who relied primarily on tap rooms to generate most of their revenue, that was their primary source of revenue is tap rooms. The second source being restaurants, both of those things uh, were closed and, and, and became a, a significant challenge for them, right? Uh, even as of it was two days ago, you know, they reclosed a lot of that tap room environment for these, these uh, breweries. And so uh, what we were able to do is help them make a transition because customer needs didn't necessarily change. People were still interested in, in drinking uh, some beer, but the, the distribution channels uh, due to regulations had significantly changed. And so what we were able to do is put them and develop for them some online platforms for distribution, kind of make a digital transformation into online. And, and so now they can sell directly to customers. In a similar experience, I work with about 4,000 retailers in, in the US. And one of the challenges they have is, is they, they are happy to sell online. They would be happy to sell online, but getting their products, uh, they, they didn't have access to their products in their, in their stores. And so we worked through some situations where, where we created drop shipping opportunities for these retailers to continue to sell online without having direct access to their inventories. And so those are some things that when we, we reevaluate how, how they, the distribution uh, works for for these companies. There's also on the side of suppliers, right? How we make our products, our, our supplier networks have also been uh, somewhat disrupted, especially if you, you uh, buy products from overseas and sell those. And, and there are new risks and new challenges that uh, companies face when, when working through their, their supplier networks. And so looking at what those risks will be now and into the future are an important part of understanding new relationships in the pivot. So I'll, I, I think there's a lot of things that are similar to, to sales and people that fit within this business model process. But, uh, you know, if we look at some of the things that we can, can do and help you uh, address in terms of making new, re, new, new strategies, new, uh, new tools uh, to, to move your business forward. Jim, I'll Good. Thank you. you. Thank you, Sam. Next, we have Scott Corvo. Scott? Yeah, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Super. Um, yes. So, I'm talking. I guess you can hear me. Scott might try just turning off the video. Scott, maybe try turning off the video uh, so you can save some bandwidth. I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm on my phone. Can you hear me now? Okay, just uh, Jim, you're going to have to, I'm having difficulty with the sound, so if you guys can't hear me, I'm. Uh, I'm fine. Hello, can you hear me? Scott, I can hear you. I can hear you. Go ahead, just get started. And if for some reason we lose you, we'll step in. Yeah, I, I had quite a few technical problems when we started out. So my apologies. But bottom line, I've been with the EIR program for about three years. Prior to that, I spent 35 years in the corporate world in senior sales and marketing positions for the first 20 years with very large consumer packaged goods companies, familiar names like the Brown Porter and Beverage Company, makers of Jack Daniels. Also, uh, Dr. Pepper, 7 up. many of you will be familiar with some of those products. I uh, became the president of a juice company, publicly traded, 
and uh, was a, obviously a wonderful experience. Uh, my first biz, really running a business experience, so to speak, was when I was the CEO of a startup company, uh, 30 employees, a plant, a great idea for material science, and about $2 million in capital. I did that for about four years until we got to profitability. And then the last 10 years of my career, I spent with an Australian company who's in the PPE business, which is perfect right now, personal protection equipment, as you can imagine, and ran their largest business unit out of Europe in Brussels. So I got involved in this in many ways because I want to give back to the community. I'm involved with nonprofits and other things, uh, mostly involved to do private uh, equity advisory work in mergers and acquisitions, which I've done a number of over the uh, course of my career uh, in places like Brazil, Poland, France, China, Korea. Uh, and, and so again, have a real strong international perspective. And my focus is on the profitability pillar, if you will. And I know many of you are probably struggling with this in terms of your businesses today and start. I think the most important thing right now is to really have a decent baseline forecast of what your cash flow needs are going to be for the next 12 months to 18 months. And what, what I like to do is kind of do a medium you know, sort of middle of the road forecasts, an upside, but most importantly right now is really be thinking about in terms of your cash flow needs is do you have sufficient funds to get through the next 12 to 18 months? And uh, you heard from Miguel on new ways to get revenue, uh, obviously, but not having a forecast puts you at a lot of risk in terms of the types of volatility you're going to see in your business. But knowing those numbers is going to give you a lot more confidence in how to address the future. The other part of that is, you know, do you have the right financing? Uh, there's a ton of sources out there today for small businesses, medium-sized businesses, you know, whether it be the traditional SBA loan route or there's others with some of the uh, federal government, as you probably are aware of some of the things that they're providing. Um, but knowing, you know, what those sources are, how much you need, a lot of that comes from that cash flow forecast that you're going to do, uh, as, I, as I outlined in my opening comments there. One of the things I'm really interested in is what's really driving the profitability of your business. So you may have a lot of products and um, some of them are actually, you know, not worth having in terms of the profitability. So what I like to do is drill down and understand your gross margins. You know, to me, a good gross margin is going to, in terms of being competitive, is going to help you really run your business because obviously all your underlines is there that you have to manage your cash flow with. So knowing what products, what services, you know, really drive the most profit for your company is really, really important to understand. Uh, and then looking at things like a lot, a lot of people are afraid to take pricing, um, you know, right now, especially given the environment. But I think you'd find if you could take pricing on certain services or certain uh, products that you have by testing that, if you will, that's going to help improve those operating margins, your net, you know, your net income and, and your burn rate. So, Understanding your costs, understanding what products can you, you know, can you actually take pricing on? Some you may not be able to. That comes through really understanding your product portfolio, your service portfolio, and, and what's really driving the profitability of your company. Um, I like to have a dashboard. Every business I've ever run, uh, I called it, you know, my decision support uh, system. I had the five critical success factors that I would measure on a constant basis. It varies by business whether it's a service business or you're a, a product-focused uh, business and so forth, uh, it's going to depend. But measuring those five things consistently is going to give you a better lens on the business and help you understand really what the future looks like. Um, you know, bottom line, there's a lot of you know, diagnostic tools that can be used in getting to some of the answers to these types of questions. That has to be done with you know, working with you directly and trying to really drill down on the business and, and look at that cash forecast like I talked about. So um, I'm excited about this program. I think, you know, it's a tough time for all of us, obviously. Um, and we're trying to give back by helping small and medium-sized businesses really try to, I don't want to use the word dig out a hole, but that's what it is, and, and get you back to profitability. So, Jim, back over to you for any questions. Great. Thank you, Scott. So uh, just to review again what I started with, the idea is to have, we have these four pillars identified where we think we can help a small business. Uh, the four folks that you heard about today is part of our team. We have others that are involved in the pillar analysis as well. And our offering today is to sign up, to complete an application online. You see the URL there, which we can share with the attendees after the meeting, as well as the PowerPoint presentation. Our offer is to offer several hours of pro bono co consultation with you as the business owner. Uh, our team will then reassemble 
uh, the subject matter experts review what the analysis shows and then come back with a one page series of recommendations or resources that we think that would be helpful to you as business owner to work through whatever your issue is. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Please use the chat session if you have questions. We've been asking, answering some of them in real time. Um, and let's open it up. Or feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question directly. And I know, Brett, you've got a bunch of questions as well. I have some comments, but I don't want to uh, take away from any of the other attendees. Um, uh, but uh, if they're going to be shy. I'll, I'll start off at least. Um, my first one was from Miguel. Miguel, you were talking about, you know, the e-commerce side of things and, and businesses, you know, getting their presence beefed up there. One of the things that we've been talking about, and I would love to just kind of hear your uh, take on this, is there was definitely a knee-jerk reaction when COVID hit for any business that wasn't strong in the e-commerce world to try and get a platform up. But um, what we've been trying to talk to businesses about is, um, you know, you want to create, you want to look at strategically, and this is where you were talking, I think, strategically, how do you recreate whatever made you special before COVID existed that made you succeed at that point? You know, whatever that special sauce was, how do you recreate it in an e-commerce way? Because it's more than just having a portal up there that people can order at. And I was wondering if I could get your, just your little take on that. Yeah, absolutely. But a great answer or a great question. Hopefully I'll give you some insight and some perspective on what I would do. So I would whiteboard the entire process. I would start from scratch. Even if people currently have what they think is a good e-commerce website, I'd start from scratch anyway and build it out and say, what if, what happens, under what conditions do you make the transfers from someone who's a casual visitor to a prospect uh, once they meet these parameters. So your funnel really has to be built in such a way that you're moving and you're engaging the visitor from curiosity to consumption. And the way you do that has to be whiteboarded first. You cannot just assume, you know, putting up a, 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 a directory or putting up a website that looks like a, a physical catalog is not an e-commerce website in today's world. That's the old model. That's circa 2000, early. We're in 2020. So everyone should really start from scratch, even if, if they've got something built, and get an opinion on how they can best structure their funnel to yield greater results in fewer steps for the greatest benefit to both the owner and more importantly, the client in terms of engagement. I've actually followed the sequence of some e-commerce sites and there's too many steps. I mean, I get confused. I get lost. I go down a rabbit hole. And that's because usually the business owner and or their consultant have not whiteboarded it sufficiently, laid it out and tested it to make sure that it works. So it's really two things you got to focus on. What is the strategic direction of your business, number one? And once you have that defined, what tools are currently available to best meet both my needs as the business owner, but more importantly, the needs of my occasional visitor who I want to turn into a client? Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Brett. Other questions? Jim, I think Susan was gonna unmute herself and ask a question. Nope, sorry. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I have a question. Uh, can I ask? Absolutely. Yeah, hi. So, um, uh, thanks for the fantastic presentation. Uh, my name is Suhas, and uh, I'm sorry, I don't have nice, pretty background as backgrounds as you guys do. I'm, I'm sitting in my, uh, my living room. Uh, I'm a I'm a business owner. I'm just actually a one man show, and uh, I started my business basically simple with, with passion for what I do, which is uh, training in uh, plastic injection molding. And so I set up an I set up a nice classroom here. My problem is very unique. I don't have employees, and so I don't have the issue of uh, um, you know motivation and all those things, which are extremely relevant, of course, that you said. Um, but I'm a, a own employee, and I'm extremely motivated. Um, my problem is that I, I I do training and last year was fantastic. I had people lined up even now before the COVID. People want to take my class, but I can't give an online class because it's a hands-on class. 
So I don't need an answer right now, but is it something that you guys can also help me uh, in, in such situations? You know, and also the other thing is that the marketing strategies that you guys mentioned, uh, which I've been always wanting to get into, um, um, I could still uh, avail, you know, th those same benefits. I just want to make sure that uh, I can make uh, use of these these two things. So I, I'll take I'll take I'll take a shot at it because I'm shimid, timid, shy, and demure. So Suhas, here's a couple of things that I might suggest for you. Everything that you do in live, are, are you the model? Are you the performer? Yes. Okay. All of that can be captured on video. And you can put all of the video properly edited with music, with subscripts, and a whole bunch of professional imagery into a online training course. Yes. That you can actually sell and promote if you're not doing that already. Um, the technology is available to do that. It, it will not cause you to go broke when properly done. And you can sequence those activities and events probably to completion in 90 to 120 days, given the right strategy and the right support staff. That, that okay. would be my short end uh, reply. So you've got technologies available, people are available. I don't know what your budget is. You don't need to reveal it, but um, it is all doable. And you could, you could clearly, uh, which, uh, what, what is, one more time, what is your service? What are you providing? So it's mainly training for people who work uh, in, in, in the injection, plastic injection molding industry. Okay. And uh, so there are people who have, so I actually have the, the challenges, although I can take videos, is that people come there and actually perform experiments and, and will mold plastic parts and uh, because I have a machine also, and, and that's how we, they do that stuff. So that is where I've got a little bit of a challenge, but. So, so the experiential <laughs> part may not be, you may not be able to put it in a can or in video. I, I get that. Yeah. But there's probably elements of it. It doesn't have to be all, it can be 80% can be done on video and you can build an e-commerce revenue stream yeah. that could be passive for you yeah. to support your physical location training. If that makes we, sense. Sure, Hoss, I, I have lots of ideas on what you could do as well, but I don't want to take all the time here. Do you have a garage by chance or have you ever considered doing the training on site? I imagine, for example, Hunter Industries might be one of your clients. They're my biggest, yeah, so that's the other thing I want to say. They're my, one of my biggest clients mm -hmm. and they have been sending people for, for training, but now the issue is that they have frozen their training budgets. Ah, okay. And so, different, different problem. Yeah. yeah. That, that. So I think we can help you with marketing too, but I don't want to dominate the conversation here. I'm definitely going to uh, sign on and uh, I would like to get that one page report uh, because uh, uh, like I said, I, I just have to grow, grow that. And I, I would like someone to look at, I'm a strictly technical guy. I don't get in sales and marketing. So I'd love to like get that information from you guys. So the other thing I'll just mention real quickly, not in my college, but we have a school of nursing and kinesiology and that requires inpatient hands-on care. So there are ways that you can provide training um, in, in place uh, with just observing some obvious uh, health protocols. And we have information about that we can provide oh. as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I don't want to take everybody else's time either. So I will apply to that program that you guys mentioned. So thank you. Who else? I had a quick question. Um, hi, my name is Nyla. Um, I've had the privilege of already having a phone call with Scott. So thank you, Scott, for your time. Um, I did have a question though on the pro bono um, uh, work, the consultation. Um, after the one sheeter, I was just wondering um, what are the plans for follow up, like periodic check ins down the road, like, you know, say in three months or six months to see how, you know, the plan was implemented. Is that included? So the intention here is not to set a long range relationship strategy. We're certainly not trying to build a consulting business. We actually have, and I think you may know this, a whole bunch of students that are always anxious to help our local businesses. So one of the paths this could lead to, and I don't know enough about your business to know whether or not that's a, an option for you, is to engage with some 
undergraduate or graduate students to help you work through the next phases. So this project that we're talking about today is a short duration over the summer. It's partly to be helpful, but it's also partly to understand better what the business community needs. Uh, and so our hope is that when we come out of this, we'll have a better understanding of what challenges you face. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I would be interested in that, uh, using one of your students as an intern or something that way too, yes. Jim, I had a question for Nula. Go ahead. So uh, on, the, on the people side of things, one of the things that we've heard from some of our businesses you know, uh, everybody had to shift to the remote working and some of our businesses as, as they started to shift back to um, bringing people back into the office, they've met some resistance. And, you know, working at home was pretty nice and pretty comfortable. And, you know, you can kind of be in your jammies and do stuff. And, but the owner is saying, you know, the efficiency for on her side, the efficiency of the output she's getting from these folks isn't the same, right? So um, would, would your section help them kind of uh, work through stuff like that potentially? Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, that's a big concern, you know, the whole productivity thing. Um, some of us feel we're actually more productive working from home. You know, other people feel they do better in the office. So I think it's looking at, you know, what are the performance metrics? Um, and that's the conversation, you know, once you've defined, you know, what, what are the expectations and how can you, and I'm not sure what the businesses are, um, you know, so what are the metrics that, you know, people are expected to meet and, you know, sort of working the conversation that way versus, you know, making it all about being in the office. Um, and, you know, obviously when we've all transitioned very rapidly to the online environment, um, you know, as, a, as, a, as an owner, as a supervisor, not being able to see my people every day and know what they're doing, you know, that's how do I, how do we build up a level of trust and confidence, um, you know, on both sides so that we are meeting, you know, kind of the required standards and people can feel, you know, because some people are definitely concerned about coming back into the office. Um, I have a good friend who's the head of HR for a local biotech manufacturing organization. So they're on site and they are seeing, you know, issues of, um, you know, COVID-19 um, popping up in the workforce, mostly because of the cafeteria and people um, are ride sharing to work. So, you know, that's, there's, I mean, there's a lot of pieces to this. So I think, you know, definitely a piece around metrics, a piece around kind of what is that good conversation to you know develop confidence and trust so that I can become more comfortable maybe managing remotely and then what are kind of the guidelines and boundaries about time in the office versus working from home so that everyone feels comfortable with the situation you know plus we know that the schools are not back yet um, daycare is not you know it's restricted so there are a lot of pieces to this so I, you know definitely I think it's an area we can help with Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Uh, my question is for Sam. Um, he talked about uh, pip uh, he talked about pivoting and the needs arising to, for um, fine products um, for people who stay home. What kind of products would those be? And the second part of that is what are some of the risks for products from overseas? Um, what, in, in general, what they were describing, just anything that would make your <clears throat> home more comfortable was kind of his, his, his finding from all of it was that there was an increase in people trying to make their home comfortable. Most of us probably spend the majority of our, our, our uh, uh, time awake at the office in the past. <laughs> So we didn't we didn't rely on uh, very much uh, comfort or, except for some some simple things at home. So that was what they found in, in uh, talking to some some businesses and what they were trying to do. So and your second question was kind of the risk of buying uh, products abroad. Yes. Uh, I can. You want me to add a little? I mean, I yeah. Go ahead, of, Scott. Yeah. No. So uh, we we had a uh, very 
in my business experience, uh, a number of products that were outsourced in, to Asia. And I, I would say to you, in my experience, uh, even today, um, we're sort of going through a V-shaped recovery. That's, you know, one, one view, if you will. And supply chains are, are constrained everywhere. I mean, I don't care if it's cars, obviously PPE. Okay. So anything that's bought overseas, particularly in Asia, and a lot of these products that, you know, we talk about that are on the e-commerce platforms come from, uh, you know, Asia, and they're constrained. And in term, depending on the product, that the risk really is you try to get back into business and you don't have a consistent high quality, you know, dependable supply chain. So you have to think through that and, it's too long uh, probably for this, this call, but I um, mean, there's also a, another set of risks in terms of, you know, who you're doing business with overseas uh, in foreign countries, you know, that we, you know, you need to be concerned about. So definitely something, if that's your business model is really relying on uh, a supply chain of the United States or even inside the United States, but most anything in Asia, you know, um, you would be, it would be good practice to really get some support and help and try to think through that. Okay, thank you. Jim, I have a question um, for Sam. Um, for the talking about the pivot and um, you know how people's buying habits have changed. Um, and you know one of the challenges again, talking to various members, who have like some brick and mortar uh, boutique retail and things like that is, um, you know, when people go through such a drastic shift like we did with COVID-19, um, sometimes buying habits change permanently. Like they, they change and they find out, hey, this is really convenient to, to just do these this way. It gets delivered right to my front door. I mean, I don't have to go out and do anything. And, um, and so, uh, you know, we've been trying to talk to folks about like, how do you reinstill that kind of confidence and, and give people that warm fuzzy that not only are you a safe place to be, but you're the right place to be. And I don't know if there was something you might be able to kind of just take away from that and share a little. Yeah, and it, it's a difficult conversation, right? Because what's happened is that there's been a realization of different value propositions. Most likely these boutiques, and, and, and like I mentioned, we work with like 4,000 retailers with one of my companies, is that what people traditionally valued kind of with some of these smaller retailers was the experience of shopping. You know, I always say it's the target version, right? Everybody's in the business model. If, if you're selling the same products as somebody else, the only way you can compete is in the business model portion of your, so, you know, target took the distribution side, they make it an experience. Walmart took the, you know, the, the build side and they work on logistics and that's where they make their competitive advantage work for them. And so I think in, in these situations where you have a boutique and they're selling the same products as other companies. And so they're not necessarily generating uh, some type of competitive advantage or value from the actual product. Then it's really trying to, what I think another question was asked earlier, it's like trying to recreate that experience online uh, is, is challenging. And so I think there is, it's a hard place to be in because creating that specific value proposition of the reason why people bought in the past, which is the experience, it is not, not the same reason why they're going to buy today. And so what you probably have to look at in terms of pivoting is, okay, if we can't recreate that specific value proposition, what other value propositions do these customers have that our products or services or our, the way in which we distribute it meet their needs? And I think that it will shift to that idea of convenience because I, I mean, that is the biggest value proposition you think of Amazon offering is that they everything's convenient. I don't have to go to the store, Instacart, big. I don't have to go to the grocery store. And so if you're competing in that value proposition with Amazon in the sense that all you're, you're providing is convenience, what are some things that you can do? And, and each company we look at, you can look at specifically, what are some things we can do in other parts of the business model to maybe capture, as Scott would say, you know, more, more profit margin. What We need to find some more margin in there. It might be coming to things like what we've seen from a lot of, um, from some of these retailers is looking at more of like 
some advanced manufacturing companies that provide more on-demand products so they don't carry any inventory, which would reduce some overhead costs and then allow them to capture more margin or to offer more products, even though they don't have to carry the inventory on those products. Um, and so some of these little, little strategies help them maybe launch an online platform, offer a lot of great products, offer them at a price that's competitive, but also, you know, reduce their costs on the back end uh, to ca capture more of that margin. So I think it, it's a challenging situation because uh, until we can get to the point where people can capture that uh, value proposition of experience, um, it's, it's a hard place to be in a little bit. Thank you. I think at this point, we probably should wind up simply because we've run out of time. Brett, again, once again, hold on, let me share my screen again. Leave the URL. <clears throat> Brett, again, thank you so much for hosting today's event and for uh, providing access to your membership. And with that, I will try to share my screen here so you can see the URL. Uh, so those of you that attended today, thank you very much. Uh, you'll see the URL there. Please feel free to fill out the application. Again, if you contact us, uh, at any of the uh, links provided, we'll be glad to meet with you and provide the service that we talked about today. And with that, I'll leave it to Brett to wind us up. All right, thanks, Jim. Thank you to all the presenters. Um, thank you to the university for offering these services and, and uh, making your expertise available to um, the business community. It was very clear from your different presentations and the engagement and the discussions that your expertise is very real. It's not just academic and in some classroom, and that's what our businesses need right now. So um, we are very appreciative of all this. This recording will be up on our website within a day. And so we'll also be you know, pushing that out so people who weren't able to join today can um, ha have access to it. But we'll also continue to, to push out the, the program in general through our e-newsletter and other channels, social media, et cetera. So thank you so much to Cal State San Marcos and to you, Jim. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again.